Okay, our next speaker is Octavian Susu, who is going to be talking about um, looking at adversarial examples in malware detection. So, anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, this is joint work with my collaborators from FireEye, uh, Scott Cole and Jeff Johns. Um, so machine learning uh, has been used extensively in a bunch of uh, security tasks, uh, one of them being malware classification. And the task here is to distinguish between malware and goodware. Um, and why uh, malware detection is particularly interesting is because it was part of a like decade-long arms race where the attackers constantly try to evade uh, the detectors. And it turns out there has been extensive work on understanding evasion attempts against uh, malware detectors and uh, machine learning based malware detection detectors uh, in particular. Uh, but nowadays we see that increase uh, use on the defender side on of like end-to-end -end learning approaches. So the goal of this talk is to try to understand uh, some of the aspects of robustness of such deep neural network based uh, approaches to malware classification and how they're robust against evasion attempts. I'm gonna start by giving an overview of how those detectors work, then present some of the domain challenges of, of creating attacks against them, and then some attack strategies that we worked on. Um, let's look at how, how feature extraction works in malware classification. So of course, like a binary is a sequence of bytes, but it turns out it's very, it has a very strict semantics, right? If it has a clearly defined structure, then based on that structure, we might extract some features such as statistics about the code that's contained in that binary, or maybe some hard-coded strings inside the banner, binary and so on. And at test time, we observe that a sample has a specific set of features, and we label the sample based on those features. Um, well, it turns out that the attacker could just easily change some of the features in order to evade our detector. Uh, so feature engineering is a very, very challenging and time-consuming task. And that's because the list of features has to constantly evolve to capture adaptive adversaries. So one solution to this is um, like end-to-end -end learning. There has been a couple of papers that started looking into such solution for malware detectors. I've, I've listed here a bunch. Uh, the goal in end-to-end in -end learning is to just automatically learn important features uh, from raw data. And uh, in order to understand how this might work, we need to take a step back and look at the natural language processing world uh, and in particular, this character level convolutional neural network architecture, which was proposed for text classification tasks. And how this works is like each character in the input sequence is mapped to a fixed size vector in embedding. Um, and then uh, there are a bunch of convolutional uh, filters, a bunch of convolutional kernels. So those are receptors trying to learn features uh, of the compositions of individual characters. So for example, words. Then we have some max pooling layers, which are filters for non-informative features. So we might want to remove very common dictionary words. And finally, we have a nonlinear classification through fully connected layers. Well, let's look at how programs might be uh, similar to text. Um, we, we could actually see bytes, individual bytes, as, as characters in this setup. Uh, whereas instructions might be the equivalent of words, or we could even look at like higher level constructs such as functions as the equivalent of sentences in natural language text. And in this light, uh, we could just uh, use the existing uh, architecture as use the programs as input to such a, a pipeline in order to predict, um, in order to predict uh, uh, malware or goodware. Uh, so one example, such example architecture is Malcolm, which was recently proposed. Um, it is a very shallow architecture. It, it has one convolutional uh, layer, one max pooling layer. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details because we're going to revisit it later. Uh, but Malcolm achieved like a quite uh, promising performance on, on malware detection. Um, so the goal of our study was to understand whether Malconv is vulnerable to evasion attacks. So to do that, uh, we started by training a robust model of Malconv. We used the, uh, the production scale data set owned by FireEye. We call it full. This contains 12.5 million samples in the training set. Uh, it has a clear separation, temporal separation between uh, training and testing samples, meaning that uh, training samples come strictly before the testing ones. 
And then there's a bunch of pre-processing done in order to try to reduce the bias of the data set. Then we use the MelConf, which was published uh, along with the Ember data set. So it's a published data set of 900,000 uh, training samples. And then in order to like observe potential bias in uh, in the, the, the data sets and the effect on the, uh, the their effect on attack effectiveness, we also sample a data set we call it mini. And this is kind of like along the lines of what other work used to uh, test their attacks. Um, okay, so let's try to attack those models. Um, there's, of course, a lot of work on image classifiers and attacking these. Some of the most influential papers uh, are, are listed here. Uh, of particular interest to us is the fast gradient sign method by Goodfellow et al. in 2015. And the question here is, can we just apply those uh, attacks directly to the malware detection task. Let's try to do that uh, uh, by looking at the binaries. So as I said, the clearly strict semantics of the binaries, we generate some adversarial noise, maybe based on the gradient of the, of the classifier, we add that to the binary, and what it turns out is happening is that we just broke the functionality of the file, right? Because we cannot arbitrarily modify the bytes of the file and expect it to be a valid executable. So we need to be smarter about how we generate our, our um, adversarial noise. So the first approach that we looked at was the pent-based attack. So this is a, a clever way of like overcoming the issue. We just generate the, the noise, uh, like the adversarial noise, and we add it at the end of the file. And by preserving the functionality, the original bytes that are found in the file, we hope that the, the functionality is preserved, right? So this has been used by prior work uh, to highlight some, some interesting attacks. Um, but what we try to do is to like just come up with a very, very naive attack. We call it the benign append attack, in which we just append bytes that are extracting from the beginning of a benign file. We add it to the mal malicious file. And you know we hope that we, we can trick the classifier like that. So this has zero feedback from the classifier. It is, it is, it is um, independent of that. Uh, and then when we tested uh, it, the effectiveness of this attack on the mini model, we look here at the success rate, which is the fraction of uh, samples that successfully evade the detector um, as a function of the number of bytes we append. Uh, we see that the, the, the attack is quite successful. I mean, it, like the success rate is linearly increasing with the size of the appended bytes. So this is probably because the model overfits uh, on the benign features and, you know, it's a very small data set and it, 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 it uses it like, um, it, it uses those features to, to distinguish between malware and, and uh, goodware. But when we try to like test the attack uh, against the more robust models, we see that it does not succeed all that much. Uh, that's because those models learn some features that are harder to overcome by simply appending benign bytes at the end. Right, so the takeaway here would be that we need to consider the potential biases in the data set used to train a classifier uh, when we draw conclusions about uh, attack effectiveness. All right, uh, with that finding, uh, we went ahead and uh, designed a second algorithm uh, for ap the append strategy. And for this, we just used the off the shelf, the fast gradient sign method, like the single step attack, one single gradient computation. And we generate that noise, we append it to the file. And because the architecture is not end to end uh, differentiable, we had to do some tricks in there. We, we actually did the updates uh, in the embedding space and then map those values back to the bytes values using the L2 distance. Um, and when we tested against those models, like two interesting things emerge. First, we see that the Ember and the full data set, the success rate on those two models is, is quite different. Um, and in particular, the model that is trained on a larger data set is, is more vulnerable to these attacks. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too many details of why this is happening because Scott will have a great talk on 
the influence on the training of the training set on the learned feature of the classifiers, but it basically highlights the fact that uh, maybe the, the full model encodes more sequential information that are easier to, to bypass using a single gradient computation. And we also are not really mindful about the direction of the gradient when we do the updates. So those are all things that could might be uh, an artifact of our attack not being uh, strong enough. But nevertheless, it highlights that the attack is quite successful. So there's like a lot of opportunity to uh, evade Malcolm. The, the success rate is quite high. So we went ahead and asked ourselves, why is this happening? Why is it so effective? And to understand this, we have to take a step back and look at the Malcolm architecture. So let's look at how it encodes the information. Malcolm like splits the embedding space into into non-overlapping sequences, and it defines like those non-overlapping uh, convolutional kernels. And I'm saying non-overlapping is because uh, the stride and the kernel size are equal 500. Uh, and then we have a max pooling layer, which just selects the most important ones. And then those selected convolutional kernels contribute uh, to the final classification. But what if we have an adversarial perturbation? In this case, uh, our, our perturbation just passes through the convolutional layer and it has the potential of overriding the important features in the max pool layer and finally influence the final classification. And the main reason this is happening is because Malkov does not encode positional features. So basically, it cannot tell the provenance of the, of the features selected through the max pooling layer and it, it treats equally those that come from the first, from the beginning of the file and uh, the appended ones. So the takeaway here is that architectural choices might actually uh, introduce vulnerability against those attacks and we need to be careful when we just uh, design our architectures for malware detectors. So now the final question we ask is, can we do even better? Can we design better attacks uh, that maybe leverage some program semantics in order to, to attack those classifiers? So for this, uh, Let's look again at the, the, the format of those executables. And if we parse a, 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 a PE file, we see that it begins with a section header, uh, which is basically uh, contains metadata about, about the file and then pointers to the sections of the executables. So for example, the code section, uh, the data section, and so on. And that's followed by the sections themselves, right? Uh, where the code or the data is stored. And then each section has the raw size, so the size on the file, in the file. And then it also has a virtual size, which is the size when the section is loaded into memory. And it turns out that the compiler might actually set the virtual size to be smaller than the raw size because of the misalignment between the physical and the virtual address. And what does that mean? That what that means for us is that we have an opportunity to inject our adversarial noise in there uh, because those regions, those Slack regions are not mapped to memory. So uh, we went ahead and designed this Slack FGSM attack, we call it, uh, which just leverages the, the, the Slack regions and it uses the, um, it, it uses the FGSM attack to, to craft the noise. And what we could see is like two things. First, we see that the attack is more successful than the append-based strategy. Uh, at the same level of leverage, meaning that at the same number of modified bytes, I get roughly 40% increase uh, in the attack effectiveness. So that's because the attack uses contextual bytes information, so information coming from the sections themselves, those bytes already being important for the classifier, and those help like boost the, the potency of our, our adversarial noise. Uh, nevertheless, there's a limit here. There's a limited number of the slack bytes that we could actually that are available for us to modify. But the takeaway here is that you know if we want to see about look at the true capabilities of the attacker, uh, we kind of need to reason about program semantics and how uh, certain program features might improve the attack effectiveness. And I'm going to summarize the findings now. Um, training set we believe matters when testing the robustness against adversarial examples, and in particular, if we have small data sets, we might in fact get skewed uh, estimates about the effectiveness of the attacks. Then the second, we need to be careful when making architectural decisions and also consider the, the potential effect of adversarial examples. And if we do not encode positional information, this can be very easily bypassed by a simple attack such as the one we designed. 
And third, the, when we want to see the, the, the real effectiveness of the attacks, uh, we want to look into program semantics and how feature importance can uh, actually hi uh, hi highlight more effective strategies. And that's it. Thank you. I think we have lots of time for questions, oh. so maybe we can start off back there. Uh, yeah, thank you. Interesting talk. So you indicated that the FGSM attack was more successful in the Slack context because uh, of yeah. contextual byte information, and I didn't yeah. completely follow that. Could you expand on that, or maybe indicate how you measure um, the the value of context? Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, those like Slack regions come in between the sections, and uh, you know uh, the, what we what we saw is that uh, some of the bytes uh, that come are encoded in those features already play an important role for the classification, and that ends up happening like helping us uh, like when we craft an, a very small number of bytes compared to a full like uh, 500 bytes. Uh, window in the append attack, right? Go ahead. Hi, this is Rajarshi Gupta from Avast. Could you go back to your conclusion slide? Mm -hmm. So very nice presentation and a great idea about the using the Slack areas. So um, w one of the challenges in, you know, you, you're, you're working on the Malcon paper. So where do you see are the advantages or where do you see the direction of where these kinds of classification to go? Um, in the sense, Malcon and a number of other work in that frame was very nice in using binary features mm -hmm. without anything else. And you're showing certain challenges to it. So where do you see as the direction in which the research should move to make these um, classifiers more robust? Well, I, I guess there's like a bunch of things that we could learn from the traditional static based classifiers, right? And in particular, I, I think it, it, it's probably uh, we cannot avoid looking into the features and parsing the pro programs basically to understand, um, you know, s some certain characteristics that might enable those attacks. Right. So I guess that's one direction. Like looking at the raw bytes alone is probably not enough uh, to defend against uh, those attacks because um, what I believe is happening is that attackers might get to a point where they design those attacks. Uh, based on features that are not really encoded by the raw bytes themselves, meaning they could slightly change the behavior or change a bunch of instructions in there, and such a classifier will be completely oblivious to that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Ejen from Colombia. So how do you make sure these injection-only attacks can um, preserve the malicious functionality and let the malware still execute the original logic? Right, that's a great question. Uh, we cannot uh, do that uh, like 100% certain, right? Because uh, that will mean running the, the program and even that you cannot be 100% certain. What we did is uh, we loaded the programs um, using a binary analysis program uh, platform before and after, and we made sure that you know some certain statistics in there uh, remain the same. Does your attack depend on the compiler? Because you're saying that the raw size and the virtual size would, could be different based on the compiler. Yeah, I have no idea about how different compilers uh, like encode this. I think it definitely <coughs> depends on on the platform, but those we looked into like. Uh, uh, Windows executable, supportable executables. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. I, I need to check with other more technical people in that space. Okay. Hello, thanks for your presentation. I'm Martin from Samsung Research. I will ask, uh, when you modify the raw content of the bytes, does it modify the hash of the binary? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean and why don't you disconsider this? Like uh, a normal approach will be if it's modify uh, the MD5, you discard or something but like so that. So like you're saying we should try to modify the file and preserve the MD5? 
that, yeah, that I mean, like the normal approach would be if it's modified, the hash you won't consider. I mean, no, for for research like normal stuff. So, okay, I mean, runtime packing modifies the c the MD5 of the of the file, right? It's it's kind of like a similar. I mean, like if you have like a a, a, a blacklist uh, based on the MD5, I guess that cannot be overcome with our okay. with our approach. But as far as the, I saw is. Uh, those classifiers learn features that are not really based on the, the right. MD5 or any other hash of the... Okay, and yeah. just a small question. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's possible to apply something like this in dynamic analysis of malware? Mm, I guess we have to define what features we're extracting based on malware analysis. I mean, adversarial attacks against malware detectors, other traditional, like non-deep learning uh, attacks have been studied extensively. There's a great bunch of papers from like, you know, 10 years ago now. So, I mean, there's definitely potential for that. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, <coughs> Alex Entrante, uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. I'm just wondering if you can comment on defenses uh, for this approach. Would mm -hmm. something as simple as a dead code elimination pass or removing bytes that don't disassemble the valid uh, instructions uh, subvert this? Right, right. So, I mean, one low-hanging fruit will be the network capacity, right? We observe that, you know, if you look at other architecture that are published out there, they're much less vulnerable to single-step attacks. Um, but I guess like those strategies that we used are also kind of easy to detect by just parsing the file and you extract some features, you look where the, the content should not be based on the PE header, right? Um, but you know, I think that's part of the arms race still. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.